Now, here's the actual agreement, which was uh, signed and published um, on uh, the 13th, Friday the 13th, August 2021. And I'm going to go through and highlight some of the things that I see of interest and of concern and that I think are just inappropriate. And again, just my opinion. So when we look at the top of the document, whenever you see a document coming from an official source, you have the official source's seal, coat of arms, or uh, flag on the top. That indicates the authority under which the document is being signed and uh, the authority that is responsible for being accountable to it. So what we see here is we see this is a corporate logo, British Columbia, all capital letters. This is a corporate uh, logo. It's actually called a word mark because it's a combination of a word and an image. It's registered, trademarked. These are symbols and um, evidence of corporations doing business, not of a British Columbia uh, province with a geographic area. If you look at the County Boundary Act in British Columbia, you'll see that the uh, boundaries of British Columbia are marked out in actual physical designations. This is a corporation that exists only on paper. It's a registered corporation with the SEC down in Washington, D.C., as is Canada. This is all corporate. So um, you have two corporations negotiating with uh, people who have a uh, rights, titles, and interests to their land and the right to self-government, which has been recognized. So uh, who's in the position of power? The people on the land or a corporation? And both of these are corporations. That's the first problem I see. And if you look at the designations here, uh, capitalizing the names, etc., on these, these are legal documents. And when uh, there's styles which are used to indicate different things in legal documents, one of the styles used is all capital letters represents a corporation. If you see uh, uh, the registrar of uh, corporations and all of the documents that are issued for a corporation in terms of its registration, the, the corporation's name is in all capital letters for a specific reason. It's so when you see legal documents, you can separate out the corporations from the non-corporations based on visually seeing the all capital letters. And this is recognized style, and a lot of people uh, in the system will argue it because they don't want you to know that this is the way it works, and they'll just deny it, and they'll make fun of people who are making this claim. But uh, again, it's, it's just arguing uh, what is uh, ridiculous to argue, except you want to pull the wool over the eyes of the people who don't know any better. So they're actually doing an agreement here between the Haida Nation as a corporate entity. That's what it looks like to me. And I'm wondering if they have a corporate structure that is, uh, is the Haida Nation a corporation? Do they have a corporation as well as um, a, a um, non-corporate uh, people um, section or portion to it? Her Majesty the Queen and Right of Canada, if you go to the Interpretation Act of Canada or of British Columbia, and you look for, in the Interpretation Act, Her Majesty the Queen in right of British Columbia or Canada, you will see that it is all in upper lower case, and uh, the R in the right is all lower case. This entire word is lower case. So you have a legal definition in the Interpretation Acts of Canada and British Columbia that show you the correct name, words, and styles to be used in legal documents when referring to Her Majesty the Queen in right of Canada or British Columbia. And those official titles in proper style are not all capitalizations. These again are corporate entities. These are not the actual uh, British Columbia and the actual Canada um, that may or may not exist geographically. They're just some type of corporation. So you have three corporations making an agreement here. And uh, I would seriously question, again, this, this is just re reflected by the logos. And uh, I, I'm not sure if this is a sovereign, probably is, um, versus a corporate, but uh, again, that's a question. So, whereas at the beginning, parties intend to foster a new nation-to-nation -nation relationship based on the recognition of high to title and rights through cooperation, partnership, and reconciliation. Well, reconciliation is a legal process now. It is, a, it is akin and uh, synonymous with war reparations. The reconciliation is uh, founded on the fact that the nation, the, the indigenous people, um, have been decimated over the centuries and are now being paid back damages and uh, other types of compensation under the title of reconciliation. 
So the monies coming through reconciliation are different than the corporate um, agreeing, agreements that are going to come out of this type of agreement. They're two separate issues, and you'll see that later on in this document here. Now, they're recognizing here that it's a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, uh, yet it appears to be corporation-to-corporation -corporation if you actually look at the parties that are signing to it. The Haida Nation has never ceded, sold, released, surrendered, or transferred title to Haida Gwaii. So this is the part of the recognition um, that uh, has been, again, legally recognized nationally and internationally and provincially. So this means that they hold title to it. That's ultimately what it means. So they allegedly are recognizing that here. And Canada enacted a UN Declaration of the Rights uh, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. This act provides a path forward for Canada to work with together with Indigenous peoples, including High Nation, to fully implement UN UNDRIP. Now, I'd have to go through UNDRIP as a whole to find out what they've promised and what tricks and traps, if any, are in there. Um, so that's something to be considered with regards to any types of agreements and this one uh, as well. And BC enacted a similar uh, act um, as being a different jurisdiction than Canada. They have their own act that respects the human rights of Indigenous people. Well, there's more to it than human rights. Um, I find that interesting to refer to it as human rights. The Haida Nation, Canada, and British Columbia have initiated reconciliation through these agreements here, which again, will all have their own conditions, their own definitions, their own limitations, and various other things. So this agreement does not stand on its own. Uh, the plan to resolve the issues in the litigation through negotiations and reconciliation agreement. The parties recognize that some issues may need to proceed to trial, and if so, will do so in a manner that is respectful of their relationship now and into the future. So what I see this agreement is, is the government is losing in court. They are losing the right to have any seat at the table with the Indigenous people. And they're trying to delay the negotiations process with this other litigation that's going on. They're trying to sidetrack it into a different type of agreement process where they make the Indigenous people think that uh, they're getting what they want, and the, but none of it's legally, legally binding. And uh, the longer you delay that litigation, the more trees and everything else you can take off the property. So it just looks like a bait and switch to me. So the parties agree as follows. Um, will reconcile, let's see, the agreement sets out the process for the parties to embark on negotiations that among other things will reconcile pre-existing high sovereignty. So here it is, again, this sounds really good that they're, they're, they're acknowledging, they absolutely acknowledge it. It's, it, it. There's no question about it, right? With assumed crown sovereignty. So how do you reconcile that the Haida have sovereignty and the assumed crown sovereignty has always operated there and wants to continue to operate there and will be capable of evolving over time based on the coexistence of crown and Haida nation governments and the ongoing process of reconciliation paying you back for all the damages that we caused you. Just make a note there, right? So here is here is the intention of the federal and, and provincial government. They are saying, um, not legally binding, they're saying it, that we recognize you have sovereignty that pre-exists our own, which means that uh, our sovereignty claim is invalid. We had no right to make it. We have no right to continue it. Uh, but we want to we want to negotiate with you so that we can coexist with you, that we can share sovereignty on your land, so that we can have a say and a jurisdictional claim to what happens and how it happens. As far as I'm concerned, this is the foundation of of the rest of the document that uh, we recognize you have rights and titles, but uh, yeah, and our claim is invalid. But we want to uh, co-govern with you. And so our negotiation is about how we're going to co-govern together. And it's, a, it's an assume the sale that uh, they have any right to co-govern. I don't think they do. It's just, again, a negotiating tactic as far as I'm concerned. The first step is to establish and implement good faith measures and negotiate terms and agenda in reconciliation agreements. That will include priority topics identified in Section 6.2. So you got to jump down to 6.2 and find out what that is with negotiation of further agreements on specific topics. So we want to negotiate with you. You're, you hold jurisdiction, you have full t rights and titles, but we're going to negotiate what we can get out of you. That's what they're saying. The other thing is good faith measures here. You know, it's capital G, capital F, capital M. Capitals don't mean anything, right? Oh yeah, except when you go to the uh, definition section 
and they define this specific phrase with the first letter capitalized. You'll see good faith in all lowercase. That's not the same thing in this same document. So we'll look at that uh, in a moment. So definition section, which you should always look at. Chief negotiator means a person appointed by party and a person designated. Well, person has a interesting uh, history within uh, law, generally means some type of um, uh, official or office uh, and not a man or a woman in their private capacity, which might or might not be a problem. Here's that good faith measure. So I've highlighted the GF and M. Right? When you see good faith measures with the first letter capitalized, it means any legally binding agreement that implements a good faith measure negotiated pursuant to 6.1. Now you got to go jump down to 6.1 again. Good faith measure. Well, has the government negotiated in good faith measure in the past? Have they operated in good faith? Have the corporations operated in good faith? Well, when you go against court orders and when you delay prosecute or you know uh, litigation, when you play all these you know games to drag things out for 20 years, is that good faith? I don't see how any indigenous group can uh, expect any good faith from any government at, at this point in time. They have proven themselves uh, to be just uh, rife with bad faith. And uh, that's just not a, that's not just a bad attitude. That's lots of evidence backing it up. So island uh, community refers to the collective of people in the villages, towns, and rural settings of Haida Gwaii. So here's where you get people. And again, there's a legal distinction between person and people. So the island community is the generic term for the whole area, which is a collective of people. But when you talk about... Um, when you talk about uh, the Haida nation, it appears here to be a corporation. So are there two entities? Is there the island um, community, which is the people, and, and the uh, um, nation, which is a corporation? Again, I'm not sure. Litigation means the legal action uh, of this case, which was started in, what, um, 2002? Anyways going on for 20 years, right? So now they're bringing this agreement in to try and head off this litigation, to try and negotiate as much outside of the litigation as possible. And, you know, maybe it's not that uh, blunt, but uh, I think it's a, a little bit of an end run around it. And reconciliation agreements means any agreements, including any final agreement or schedule that's negotiated pursuant to this agreement, and which sets out the constitutional relationship. Interesting term. I would find out what exactly that means. And uh, define their respective powers, authorities, jurisdictions, and duties. And again, the provinces and the governments are giving themselves powers, authorities, jurisdictions, and duties. They're just keeping as much as they can. And this is all negotiation about how much they're going to keep for themselves and how much they can get out of um, the Haida Gwaii. So in negotiating, this is a principle. The negotiate, in negotiating the reconciliation agreement, the parties will be guided by the following principles. The Haida nation asserts its inherent title throughout and rights with respect to Haida Gwaii. That sounds really good, okay? They're just asserting it, right? British Columbia recognizes that Haida nation has inherent title throughout and rights with respect to Haida Gwaii terrestrial, including the inherent right of self-government. Sounds really good. Till we get to the end where they say it's not legally binding anywhere. So British Columbia's and Canada's recognizing it means nothing. This is just an empty, yeah, 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 you're, 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 you, yeah, you're independent, absolutely. Yeah, you own the title. You sure you do. And in the background, they're trying to get as much away from you that they, as they can. The parties agree to negotiate in good faith. I don't consider this in good faith with the uh, statement at the end saying it's not legally binding. Uh, if it's true, why can't it be legally binding? Why are they holding back on that? So the parties agreed to negotiate in good faith with respect to the application of inherent Haida title and rights throughout the reconciliation agreements and good faith measures. The Council of Haida Nation is the principal governing body of the Haida Nation under the constitution of the Haida Nation and Haida citizens are defined in the constitution of the Haida Nation. Again, here's more legal documents to go through to find out what actually are they saying. What are the Haida citizens? What are actually their rights? Are they people or are they... Uh, corporate um, incorporated entities that have limited rights. There's there's a whole bunch of stuff there. 
The parties recognize the inherent high title rights, including the right to make laws and to manage lands and resources. Again, sounds really good. The parties will, recognize, will negotiate in good faith to reconcile their respective interests, including with respect to laws and management of resources in Haida Gwaii Marine. So what are the interests of provincial province and Canada? Well, let's see. Uh, if, if Haida Gwaii has full title, full rights, what claim of interests do the province and Canada have? None. Absolutely none. They have no interests in it. They only have whatever um, equipment that is on the land that they've paid for or something like that, but they have no interests in the land itself or the laws. First first uh, law, which is uh, uh, indigenous law, uh, is the only law that exists unless they give up the right to be the only law by negotiating that way and sharing the right to have different laws on their land. Same with the management. As far as I'm concerned, they have 100% management rights and titles, and they either negotiate it away or they don't. The reconciliation agreement will further clarify and harmonize each party's responsibilities in jurisdiction and management. This is in sales called assuming the sale. They are just, again, reiterating the fact that we have rights here and, you know, we're going to negotiate with you about what you rights you get. Well, I don't think that. Including consideration of concurrent laws and titles, cooperative measures, and weighted authorities. So it's a bunch of gobbledygook to say that uh, our law exists there, our titles may exist there, we have uh, measures that we're involved in, and we have weighted authorities. Well, whose authority rules if the first law of the land is uh, indigenous? Consistent with previous undertakings, the Haida Nation reaffirms that island residents will not be dispossessed of lands and property. So that's just saying that anybody who isn't part of a uh, Haida Nation isn't going to get kicked off lands. But again, this isn't legally binding. So the agreement here, um, they don't have to be held, held to. As far as I'm concerned, they could kick people off the land without breaching this agreement because this is not legally binding. Will they do that? I sincerely doubt it. Private lands, except those lands acquired by the Haida Nation, will remain under exclusive provincial jurisdiction. Here is another claim of uh, it's our property, it's our land, it's our jurisdiction, we have sovereignty over it, when they just previously said that uh, the Haida Nation has full rights, titles, and interests. So how can they do that? Okay. Parties agree with existing local municipalities will continue to be incorporated and operate under provincial jurisdiction and that any sale of public lands within municipalities will be subject to the approval of the Haida Nation and British Columbia. Co-governing again, um, operated under provincial jurisdiction. Well, if you're on, you know, Haida Gwaii land, uh, why would it operate under provincial jurisdiction? And they have to agree to that. If they don't agree to it, it's not. The Haida Nation and British Columbia will review and maybe by agreement amend the boundaries of municipalities. So that leaves an open door. Unless they otherwise agree to by the Haida Nation and British Columbia, the development of any non-renewable resources on Haida Gwaii will be subject to mutual agreement. I'm not sure what the non-renewable resources are, but it could be mining or something like that. Um, but anyways, again, um, inserting themselves as if they have some right to negotiate. The parties intend that the negotiations may result in reconciliation agreements that will be protected under the Constitution Act and the Constitution of the Haida Nation. So the Constitution Act is Canada. Well, if Canada has no right, why would anything be under that Constitution Act? The agreements, subsequent agreements, and the negotiations will meet the standards and protect all rights of Haida Nation as recognized by the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Another document, again, to look at to find out what it actually says, um, but basically saying that it has to be in alignment with that, which is fine, I suppose. But uh, even the, the, the Indigenous people do not have to recognize these documents, uh, the United Nations documents. They're, you know, from a different legal system. So if they don't want to recognize it, they don't have to. So you're actually getting Haida Gwaii to, or Haida Nation to agree to documents they don't have to agree to in this particular case. It may be beneficial, may not, I don't know. Co-development mandates. Here it all is with regards to the fact we want to work with you. We want shared jurisdiction. We want to share management, right? And they're going to try and keep as much for themselves, of course, uh, the government that is. Uh, parties acknowledge that they will each have to seek approval of, for good faith measures, measures and final ratification of the reconciliation agreements. Uh, any issue that we, they view as significant to reconciliation and cooperative relationship are not covered by Canada or British Columbia's existing mandates. 
Parties will work together to ensure all perspectives are brought forward and considered. It'll be interesting to find out uh, how far they push it. It is recognized that Canada may have obligations under public international law that may affect federal or provincial mandates. Canada may identify such obligations it believes relevant to the negotiations. Well, I find this a really uh, interesting piece that I would get all of these things on the table ASAP. Uh, you know, what are those obligations? And what are the federal and provincial mandates that may be affected by it? And what effect is a, is a federal or provincial mandate a law? No, it's not. Does a federal or provincial law or mandate actually have any force and effect on, for, uh, on indigenous land that they have 100% jurisdiction over? No. So, uh, interesting. Trial of the action will not commence while the parties are engaged in good faith negotiations. So this is putting the whole uh, trial uh, on hold again. Uh, I think it's a delaying tactic to allow them to continue to negotiate for years and uh, strip more assets off the land. Where agreement is reached, litigation counsel will discuss whether it is appropriate to reflect such agreements in the litigation. Well, I find this interesting because if you actually make an agreement and you don't make it part of the litigation uh, record, um, what force and effect does it have? Is it a secret agreement? I'm curious. Without agreement, the parties subsection 7-1, got to go down there to find out what that is, applies to these reconciliation negotiations undertaken pursuant to this agreement, which are privileged and may not be disclosed or relied upon in litigation. And again, they may make side agreements which don't form part of the litigation. Then it's not part of the public record, and then you don't know what's going on. Where the parties, litigation counsel, don't reach agreement, um, they are going to go to judicial mediation. Well, I don't think the courts necessarily have been fair, uh, so you expect them to be fair again in, in these days. Who knows? Agenda for negotiations, good faith measures. As first negotiation priorities, Canada, British Columbia, in collaboration. We want to collaborate with you. You have everything and we want to collaborate with you. We will identify and seek the required authorities and level of resources in support of good faith measures. Remember, go back up to that definition to find out what that means. The parties will make best efforts to complete the approval of resources required for these good faith measures. And uh, they could be a uh, transfer of certain forested lands to the Haida Nation, acquisition of um, private properties, which are seller willing buying, buying, buyer transfers. So somebody owns some property and they sell it back, so it's transferred to Haida Gwaii. Support for social and cultural measures, such as longhouses, amenities, and language. Support for pursuit and implementation of priority business opportunities. Support to create a socioeconomic development plan for the Haida Nation. I believe these three things are part of the reconciliation process, which has been mandated nationally, uh, where money is owed to the Indigenous people to help them reestablish their cultures, their communities, their laws, their self-governance. So um, that's part of the um, reconciliation monies, I believe, that are available. Canada and the Haida Nation will address cooperatively developed and endorsed, cooperatively developed, future commercial. So again, Canada, they want to get in on the commerce deal and want to negotiate uh, the biggest slice of the pie they can and the most control they can. The parties acknowledge their ongoing negotiations with the Haida Nation and Canada with respect to fisheries and marine resources. Well, if you have uh, offshore rights as Canada, Canada claims out to 200 miles, well, what is Haida Nation uh, off of the Haida Gwaii as their, their territory? So again, Canada's trying to claim um, all of the commercial marine um, rights, and uh, they don't want to give that up, which confirms commercial fisheries across uh, for the Haida Nation before addressing rights. So they're putting their commercial interests, as far as I'm concerned, my understanding of this, ahead of the negotiations with the Haida Gwaii, and they don't want to give up any of those commercial fishing rights and that uh, offshore jurisdiction that they presently claim. So Haida governance, let's see, um, priority topics for negotiation, Haida governance, adjustment to a post-reconciliation agreement, cooperative government system. They want to co-govern. They want to be in there like a dirty shirt. Ongoing fiscal relationships with Canada and British Columbia to support Haida governments, including institutions. One of the rules is, if we give you money, we have a say. 
And so they want to continue to continue to continue to give money so that they continue to have a say in laws and jurisdiction and access to resources. Now, the reconciliation money uh, should be outside of that. That is money to compensate for damages, and uh, that would be a different type of compensation. So ongoing fiscal relationships continues uh, legal uh, rights and, and interests by Canada and British Columbia, which I think is a dangerous thing if you really want sovereignty. Seeking mandates to implement the details of how Canada and British Columbia will recognize the Haida Nation as a distinct order of government. Mandates to implement the details. How Canada and British Columbia, well, why don't they just make a determination and publish it, that they do recognize it? I think that's what's done internationally. Determining divisions and relationships of jurisdictional and management powers over Haida Gwaii. See? Here it is again. Divisions and relationships of jurisdictional and management powers. Government of Canada and British Columbia want to divide up the power over the Haida Gwaii. Then, then it's not the Haida Gwaii's land if they continue to hold power and have a say and claim jurisdiction and claim to be able to manage it and uh, enforce their management laws and stuff like that. If you have a foreign country making laws, claiming jurisdiction, uh, in on your land, you are not sovereign and you're not uh, self-governing. Uh, without prejudice to this long-term goal and aid of achieving it, various incremental agreements may be negotiated as stepping stones. Well, yeah, just chip it away over the years. Um, integrate and collaborative approach. Collaborative for the uh, planning and management of the protected areas. Longer-term goal of Haida Nation jurisdiction and management. Longer-term goal. So we're going to very carefully walk you from where we are to full control to where you have some control and then you'll have a little bit more and then maybe sometime in the future if we hold to our agreements um, you'll actually have jurisdiction and management. I don't know. Are you going to trust that? Define uh, each party's responsibilities in jurisdiction and management of Haida Gwaii terrestrial through practical, innovative and unique arrangements. Innovative and unique. Why not just give people the power to their own property and let them go at it? Delineating private lands on Haida Gwaii and public lands within municipalities. Repatriate, repatriation of lands. Haida land status and the mechanism for holding Haida land. Yep, that's all interesting. Spatial considerations and limitations related to jurisdiction, international, constitutional, legal obligations, and other matters. That's a mouthful. Spatial considerations. I'd like to understand that. I'm. That's, you know... A specific area defined, I'm sure, um, and limitations reg related to jurisdiction. Well, they either have jurisdiction or they don't. International constitutional legal obligations, I wonder what those are. We'll, uh, we'll define each party's roles and responsibilities in the management. Well, you want to share management or do you want to take it over? Addressing Haida Nation's right to redress, including just, fair, and equitable compensation consistent with Article 28 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. For greater clarity, where there have been and continue to be third parties who have been granted rights and privileges by the Crown, the Crown alone will bear responsibility for redress and compensation to the high donation. And this is because the Crown had no right to sell the property in the first place to corporations, to private uh, landowners. The Crown is liable to compensate for the fact that they sold it unlawfully because they had no sovereign claim to it all right so um this one here right to redress including just fair and equitable compensation that's uh i, I think that's a big open door for um everybody who's indigenous and uh, should be using so again this can be educational to find out uh you know where to look for how to go after your compensation the parties will identify coordinate efforts across existing processes between the Haida nation canada british columbia with respect to marine resources, ocean protection, and marine management. Like, they're doing a good job of those things, so they want to keep their hand in it. Um, I can see resource-wise and people-wise, there may be some uh, input uh, that would be required short-term. Ultimately, I would uh, expect that that should be handed entirely over to the Indigenous. Reconciliation of provincial, federal, and Haida laws will be discussed. Reconciliation of those three things. Well, how about just Haida laws? Wouldn't that be good if you're a sovereign nation, just to have Haida laws? Long-term negotiation, uh, agenda for negotiations. What is carbon sequestration and low-carbon economy and lifestyle be in here? I don't see uh, the Haida Gwaii as being a place where a lot of that's going on. 
And if they're really, really, really worried about carbon, they wouldn't be chopping down all those trees. All those trees eat carbon for lunch. There are carbon storage units. So I wonder about that stuff. General positions, uh, provisions. Now the pink red stuff here, um, those are really important, curious points. This agreement describes the intention of the parties and is not legally binding. So all those great, wonderful things we said about, you know, we recognize your rights and titles, etc. We didn't really mean that in the bigger context, in the legal context. We're only saying it in the context of this piece of paper for the purposes of, of us negotiating with you so that you think we actually respect your rights and titles. Related negotiations are without prejudice. So any negotiations that we have with you, any agreements that we have with you, you can't use them in a court of law. Okay, that's what that means. And cannot be used, construed, or relied upon by any party in any proceeding as evidence or admission of the nature, scope, or content of ge or geographic extent of Haida Nation's Aboriginal rights, including title or of crown interests. So everything we said at the beginning of this document about how much title you have, how much interest, how much we respect it all, what your land is, etc., etc., they take it all away right here. It's all gone. Can't use it anywhere. Can't use it in a court case. Can't use it in the ongoing litigation. Our recognition is an empty promise. How does that make you feel? The fiscal resources for the good faith measures provided by Canada that are described in 61B, uh, with exception, will be considered an advance section uh, 35 rights settlement payment. An advance section 35 rights settlement payment. So basically what they're saying here is that if we give you any money for fiscal resources under the good faith measures, it's going to be considered a prepayment of the money that we owe you under this section 35 settlement payment. So if we give you 10, 10 if we give you a billion dollars and we owe you $10 billion, well, that billion is going to be deducted from that 10 that we also owe you under the 35. Um, so this section 35, um, I got. I don't remember the name of the um, document agreement, whatever it was that Section Thirty Five is out of. But apparently, Canada owes the money, settlement money, and uh, you know if we give you any money, it's coming off of that. Um, we'll offset against any amount that Canada pays under final negotiated Section Thirty Thirty Five right settlement, or must pay under court award. So, you know, if we give you some money uh, under this section, just the good faith measures. Anything we give you money under that comes out of your Section 35 payment. Um, any funding from federal programs of general application for which the Haida Nation may be eligible will not be considered an advance under Section 35. See, there's two pots of money. There's one pot of money from under 30 section, five, section 35. And then there's one pot, which is uh, other federal programs of general application, which are available to the Haida Nation. So... Uh, again, two places and two accounting. The fiscal resources or economic value of the good faith measures provided by British Columbia, right, are offset against the amount that British Columbia is going to have to pay under 35. So both Canada and British Columbia owe money under Section 35. And there are additional provincial programs like this here, right, for which high donation may be eligible. So same thing. Both Canada and the province have Section 35 payments that are due, and they have a um, provincial program, a federal program, where they uh, can get money which are separate from that and will not be deducted from. This agreement is not a treaty or land claims agreement within the meaning of Section 25 or 35 of the Constitution Act, but is intended to lead to reconciliation agreements, which will be protected under the Constitution, Haida Nation, and the Constitution Act. Again, you got to go through those two acts. So maybe the Section 35 is the 35 of the Constitution Act. So uh, some, some court case or the reconciliation agreement determined that uh, funds were owing under Section 35. So nothing in this agreement will be construed as affirming, recognizing, altering, or abrogating, or de derogating from any right or title, uh, title or rights of the parties. So they're basically saying that, uh, you know, 
all of our claims to right and title are intact where it doesn't change anything. Um, but then again, it's all not legally binding. So the parties are committed to resolving disputes, may utilize any dispute resolution mechanism as agreed, meditation and or hybrid processes and principles for dispute resolution derived from the crown and hide a nation laws. How about just hide a nation laws? Since it's your land, your jurisdiction. Parties agree to work together in a collaborative, respectful, and transparent way. Well, I'm not sure if some of these things in here are respectful, and I'm not sure if they're transparent. So, and again, what's the track record for um, uh, Canada and the province uh, honoring agreements? Uh, if the dispute involves only two parties, the third party may choose to not participate. If a party chooses not to participate, it will be deemed to have accepted the outcome of the process. And this is acquiescence by silence. So... Uh, if somebody gets invited to the table to put their two cents in as to what they want and how they want it, and they'll come to the table, they waive their right. Um, each chief ne negotiator may invite additional party representatives to participate in the process identified, including HIDA law and knowledge keepers, counsel, or other experts and facilitators. So having the HIDA law um, guide this, uh, I think, is um, really, really important and valuable. For the purpose of this section, the principles are relevant federal and provincial deputy minister and the executive CHN or their des designates. This is an interesting thing from the system that I've noticed is that uh, a lot of the people who are doing the work and signing the paper and are the front facing are the um, interim or the assistant or the deputy and not necessarily the actual um, minister or um whoever would, would normally have been appointed or was appointed. I don't know what that means, but I find it interesting. It's a common thing. Just convenience in some cases. Each party shall pay its own costs and cover an equal portion of any common costs. Well, and that's for the dispute resolution. Well, personally, I think that the governments, based on the fact they've had an illegitimate, unlawful claim to jurisdiction and a costly for uh, Indigenous people, decades of litigation... Uh, should be paying for everything with regards to legal costs. Just my two cents there. So they can terminate. Either party can terminate with the notice. Now, this is another interesting thing. So there's a signature page here, but there's only one signature on it. And there's actually three copies of this page. And it's the same page. And there's one signature from each party on it. There is no document which has, in this document anyways, all three signatures on the same page. Doesn't seem like it would be a valid contract to me if you had separate pages with separate signatures. It's a unique thing. I don't know if it's sort of valid or not. And then here's the um, signing on behalf of the all caps, signing on behalf of the all caps, um, all caps here, etc. So, you know, who's really represented on this? Here's the second page. That's the second signature. Here's the third page. That's the third, third signature. That just seems really weird. And here's some maps and stuff showing the boundaries and so on and so forth. Part of this, what they call schedules. And I find this interesting is the green area here is the area that is the um, protected terrestrial. And I'm, I'm curious why they're calling it terrestrial versus land. I wonder if there's anything there. But what is all, they don't have, they don't have an indicator on this, this map here, what the light the light area is. Who, who, who's, whose is that? Is that the provinces? Is that federal governments? Uh, is it a hole in the ground? Why is not indicated in here as to what it is? Uh, so, yeah. And the protected marine, you can see that uh, they're recognizing the marine, but then, of course, the government has said we want to help manage all that. And why, why, why would the marine be so narrow here? Why wouldn't it go up further? The uh, territorial jurisdiction of countries, nations, is 200 miles out, or no, 20 miles out. It's either 20 miles or 200 miles out from the uh, um, shore. Why is this so narrow? Uh, especially since these were a seafaring people with canoes that probably went out much further than this. Again, just asking, curious. Anyways, uh, those are my thoughts on uh, the article the news about the article um, that it was reporting and the actual agreement itself. I think that there's uh, a lot of problems 
and I've looked at other agreements that have been finalized and you know it sounds sounds really good and then you get down to paragraph 17 or 27 or whatever in the document and it says that um, the province and Canada still have jurisdiction on the land of this nation which has just been granted self-governance and their sovereignty recognized. So how can you have sovereignty if you have a third-party state, nation, or corporation coming in and making laws and enforcing laws? Um, I think it's a, a huge, huge assumption and presumption on the part of these negotiators that, that it's legitimate. I don't think it is, and I'm really curious to see what happens. And, uh, you know, if anybody actually moves forward with eliminating the right from the federal and provincial government to have a say. Once we're recognized, this is our land, this is our laws, this is our jurisdiction, we'll negotiate from that position, not from a co-governance position. I'd like to see that. I'd be interested in seeing what happens. Anyways, those are my thoughts. Have a great day.